Hi guys. So I am Katie Mikey and I am going to be your guide into A Psychology 9990 uh, for this entire school year. So today we are going to talk about Canley and the amygdala. All right. So let's look at some background information about this study. It's in the biological approach. So we're looking at the links between um, the amygdala and any emotional um, responses, uh, any emotional memory experiences, and so forth. So the amygdala is located in the medial temporal lobe of your brain. It's right next to the hypothalamus. So being next to the hypothalamus, it, it creates even stronger connections because the hypothalamus's job, amongst other things, is to take those memories and send them off into long-term memories or storage. So um, where the hypothalamus might focus on a lot of spatial navigation or um, memories that stick for long term, like navigating your house or navigating in a city. So together they are part of the limbic system. And um, but but overall, we're t we're just talking about the amygdala today and that area of expertise, as you'll find out after the results of the study, is um, emotional memory. And it seems as though the more fearful the image, um, the more intense the image, the more likely we are to create a memory uh, within the amygdala and especially helpful to the hypothalamus. So let's get started. So the first thing that you should know about this study is we have some scientific equipment. I have an fMRI machine, a functional magnetic resonance imagery. You need to know what that stands for. All right, go look it up online, look at a YouTube video of what the machine looks like if you've never had one in a hospital before. Um, so the aim of the study is we, we are taking images with high emotions and we want to know if they will be remembered more often than those with less emotions. So our participants happen to be volunteers for the study. They are all females, all right-handed. Um, so we already have a couple biases that are red flags. We have all females, a gender bias. Um, they're all right-handed, so it's not going to be generalizable to any left-handed people. Um, and on top of that, they're volunteers. So they have a motivational bias already within them wanting to participate. So it's imp also important to know that the study chose females to be part of this study specifically because they felt that females would feel emotions more and also be more apt to um, talk about the emotions more. So that's why we chose females. Okay, so um, in this study we have 96 scenes and they are scenes that are supposed to elicit some type of emotion. Now, our independent variable for this study is emotional intensity. So that is on a scale of zero to three. So if you are the participant, close your eyes, imagine yourself being the participant in the study. You are going into the MRI machine and you are taking a, um, an image of your brain, a bunch of slides or slices images of your brain. Um, and while you're in there, you are being shown an image. Now, out of 96 scenes, you're going to see all 96, but you're going to see them in different order than the guy next to you or the other guy or the other, well, girl in this instance. So the images are going to be random, and we did that to control for order effect. So um, you are flashed a scene, and in that 2.88 seconds that you are able to see that, you have a button to push, zero, one, two, or three. Three is highly emotionally intense and zero is not emotionally intense. So maybe a, an example of a zero might be someone going to the mailbox to put in a letter. And for myself, I'll say um, of three might be someone on fire running down the street because we have to remember at the end of the day, this is all subjective and it's all based on your personal experiences, right? So if someone is used to seeing violence, then their numbers might differ than someone who is not used to seeing violence. Okay, so um, that's our independent variable, emotional intensity, um, and our dependent variable is the activation within the amygdala. So at the moment that you are being shown an image, we are taking 11 slides of your brain through this machine, and it's going to show us the range of activation in the amygdala. 
So what we're looking for is some type of correlation. We want to see, um, for example, if you rate an image a three, we if that's highly emotional, then we want to see more activation in the amygdala. And we want to see that um, a continuous pattern throughout all the images and throughout all our participants. Because remember, individual differences we have to account for, but if everyone shows similar data, then it makes everything that much stronger. Okay, so um, random order of scenes, we want to control for order effect. Why control for order effect? Uh, for example, if everyone saw um, a burning person on fire, yes, um, a three. So what we tend to do as humans is compare every other image to that image. So um, let's just say that we think that that is our max and we see that first. It's, it's going to skew the data of all of the other images to follow. So what we want to do is mix it up for everyone so that doesn't necessarily um, show a pattern through everyone's, um, everyone that's being tested. Okay, so um, in between each image, you had 12.96 seconds of no image and then a new image would appear. So this happened 96 times while you're in the machine. All right, day one, done. Ethics are pretty good on this study, um, considering they were volunteers, they already knew what they were in for, but there is a little deception involved because three weeks later, our participants were called back for a memory recall test. And this test involved re-showing our participants those 96 scenes to see if they remembered the images. What we were looking for, sneakily looking for, is a connection between um, do people remember the images that are more emotional or the ones that they rated as more emotional um, or vice versa? They remember the zeros less. Do they remember the threes more? What's, you know, what's going to happen with this? So um, we couldn't just call them in and say, hey, do you remember this one? Do you remember this one? Do you remember this one? And just account for the fact that they'd be telling the truth or not that they would lie on purpose, but some, some might, you never know. Um... So what we did was we took 48 new scenes that matched the level of valence um, for each image. So for example, if we took out four um, images that were rated overall a mean of a three, if we took the four out, we're going to put four foils in that would be an image that would be that emotionally intense, like that of a level of a three. Um, if we took out a lot of zeros, we're going to replace them with zeros. And, and the whole point of this was to see if our participants said that they remembered the images that were actually not part of the original study. If they said that they remembered a lot of those images, then it's going to let us know that their memory was not all that great. Um, but some of them, they did a great job in remembering a majority of the ones that were part of the study. So um, on the ones that they said that they remembered, we just asked them to clarify whether they remembered or know what they saw the image. There's a difference, okay? So um, let's talk about the controls of the study. We have 2.88 seconds that each participant was able to see the image. That's really important because if you're able to see an image longer or less time, then um, you know there's details in the image or you might change your mind or there's something you might see that somebody else might not have seen and it's just not the same for each participant, right? We want all the trials to be um, exactly the same as much as possible other than accounting for individual differences. Um, all the scenes were in random order for our participants. Remember that to control for order effect. Um, all our participants were right-handed. So if we were to redo the study, the reliability may not be that great if we don't have all right-handed participants. Uh, the reason we did that is because they, they're looking at the brain um, and activity of the brain. And you know we have two sides. Um, we have two amygdalas, technically, even though they're right next to each other. Um, and uh, only, obviously, one side is lighting up while we are, you know, uh, controlling for that right-handedness. We we're only looking at one side of, of the brain. So if we do have multiple left and right-hand people in there, we're going to see different types of data, left side, right side. There could be other variables involved. So we want to control that as much as possible. Um, so the results of the study were awesome. We saw some positive correlations. The amygdala activation is related to subjective emotional intensity. Um, and in the memory task, memory performance was improved for scenes related to high emotions. So what that means is 
as images were highly in intense in emotion, we saw more activation in the amygdala. Um, and the same for memory. So the images that were more intense, we saw that people remembered them more. So there is some type of connection within the amygdala with highly emotional and in intense um, emotions, memories, um, and, and remembering of some sort. I know that, that sounded a little weird. So there in the amygdala, basically we have um, memories of highly fearful emotions. Um, and thanks to our hypothalamus, which is right next door, that he just like takes those memories and like shoots them over to long term so we can uh, store them. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out good for us. Sometimes it's good, you know, natural selection. We want to learn from our mistakes, um, but sometimes they're imposed on us, um, like war, for instance. And then um, what we do is we hold on to those very fearful memories and then we have we have people that end up with PTSD. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do is just change it up a little bit and we're going to talk about the um, evaluation of the study. My trusty note card here. All right, so um, really quickly, we're going to go over information you need to evaluate this study. We talked about um, the independent and dependent variable. The method of this was a laboratory because our participants went to um, the researchers, it wasn't something, it wasn't a place that they were natural, um, naturally in. So ecological validity is going to be low. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, so for each study, you need to know, um, the, the design. So the design was a repeated measures because our participants were measured on each section of the independent variable. They were measured. They, they saw zero images. They saw one images. They saw twos. They saw threes. Um, if a, if a participant only witnessed zero images, you know, the images that were rated as zero in intensity, um, then it would be independent measures, but they were rated on each. So it's repeated. Okay, so after each study, what you need to know about each study, um, I call GRAVE, and a lot of other teachers call GRAVE too, G-R-A-V-E. So we have generalizability, reliability, application, which is also the usefulness of the study. What did we learn? How do we use this to our benefit? Um, validity, we can talk about internal validity or external. I always tell students to focus on external validity if you don't understand internal validity um, because that's ecological validity is easy is an easier concept. Um, and then ethics. So ethics are always important. We have to know what we did well and we have to know what we could have improved on. All right, so let's go. Let's tackle this. Um, Canley, uh, we have a sample of 10 right-handed females. The study is not generalizable, um, not generalizable to men. It is not generalizable to left-handed people. Um, it is really not generalizable outside of this research ethics group. Remember, there was a, a motivational bias here. Um, females were chosen because researchers thought they would have a higher emotional response and um, they might react differently to the scenes that were presented to them. So I think overall... Um, this is like narrow into just females that are right-handed, unfortunately. So not really good on generalizability. Okay. Um, reliability. Reliability is when, uh, it's like that reliable friend that's always there for you when you need them. You know, um, you can test and test and test and you're going to get the same results every time. Um, we do have a problem with the replication and the fact that we have all right-handed female. So if we did replicate the study and we wanted to get similar results, then we would have to use the same exact population. But overall, the study had high controls. It was standardized, so it should be really easy to replicate, um, like the 2.88 seconds on the images and the 12.9 seconds in between images, um, the random order, the 48 foils. And yeah, stay at home mom. So kids are playing. I apologize if you hear anything. Application. So how useful was this? What can we do with this information? Okay, um, I've seen a lot of kids just answer, like, um, we could use this to improve research. We could use, we, doctors can use this to diagnose patients. That is not going to cut it on the Cambridge answer. You need to um, provide an example from the text using the conclusion and then use that in modern society to improve the world we live in somehow. So um, Canley did find an association between emotional impact um, and, and memory in the amygdala. 
So understanding this, um, it might help doctors to understand damages to the brain for participants or, or people, patients that lack emotional intensity. Um, it gives us reason why those with PTSD have such <coughs> excuse me have such intense <clears throat> memories <coughs> mm. excuse me <clears throat> okay all right I'm done having my coffee too woohoo Okay, sorry, just coughing something in my throat. Okay, so um, how do we improve the world we live in with this? Just understanding the fact that we make such strong connections with the places we are and the people we are. Remember the, the hypothalamus. Hey guys, I need you to be quiet, please. We need to understand that it isn't just making a visual memory. It's, we are using all of our senses, um, specifically visual in this and location wise and, and spatially. And that really strengthens that memory, right? So, I mean, imagine seeing something from afar opposed to being able to see it and smell it and taste it. Okay, it creates even... <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Um, validity. So we do have standardized procedures. The lengths and the interview, the intervals of the images, those are all standardized. So this is creating higher and stronger validity. In, internal validity is, did we measure what we intended to measure? I need you to go because mommy's trying to finish this lesson, okay? They don't know. Okay. Um, internal validity. It is high. Researchers can be confident um, that there were few confounding variables because we did control for so much. And um, the fact that we didn't tell the participants about the coming back in three weeks, that's helping us to assure that it was real memory and it wasn't like coaxed. For instance, if I tell you that you have a test tomorrow, you're going to go home and study. But if I give you a pop quiz, it's, you know, what did you actually get out of that lesson or what did you remember naturally? The last thing is ethics. And um, informed consent was given um, to all participants and they were aware of the nature of the experiment. There was a little deception because the participants weren't unaware of the follow-up. But it doesn't make it a bad study. It's just something that you're going to have to state in your answer. Right? We want... Um, good and bad when we evaluate something we want to say what we did well we want to say what we did bad um, and just kind of even it out all right